Welcome to Central News, I'm Amy Forrest. In today's news, Waikato DHB recently updated their emergency plan and have even had real event tests. A health emergency could be anything that is a serious threat to the health status of the community, such as the swine flu epidemic of 2008. While key regional hazards have been identified, the DHB says they have to be ready for other factors, including animal epidemic, earthquake, tsunami, rural fire, human pandemic, major transport accident, flooding or severe storm. Emergency Management Planning Manager Trevor, Trevor Ecclestone says the Health Emergency Plan provides for an all-hazard approach to managing in emergencies. Okay, I think it's very really important that people follow the general civil defence instruction and that's listen to the radio. So having that um, battery operated radio or going into your car um, will give you that opportunity. Um, one of the first messages that you'll hear from those civil defence emergencies is the health message and you'll get things like boil your water, um, wash your hands, those sorts of, that sort of information, where to go to for health services. Um, always, if you have the opportunity, open up the DHB website because that will be kept up to date with lots of relevant advice and um, we will be monitoring the social media, Twitter, Facebook situation as well, perhaps placing information on there. Not perhaps, we will be placing information on there as well. The University of Waikato has won two out of six 2012 teaching and learning research initiative projects and is collaborating on a third. The projects are funded by the New Zealand Council for Education Research and are worth more than $400,000. Two of the projects are being conducted by the Wilf Malcolm Institute of Educational Research at the University of Waikato. Director of the Wilf Institute of Education, Bronwyn Cowie, says one of the projects is to investigate the use of multiplication and division to help young children develop a greater appreciation of the properties of numbers. Yes, they were um, three teaching and learning initiative projects. That is the key education funding that's available in New Zealand at the moment. And what's special about it is it focuses in on teaching and learning. How can, how can we do research that actually helps students learning in some way and teachers teaching? Acute taxoplasmosis, an infectious disease carried by cats, may be a much more severe illness than previously understood. Recent research from the University of Auckland has shown that the disease commonly caught from cats can be a much more severe and disabling illness than doctors and researchers have believed. About 40% of New Zealanders are infected with taxoplasmosis at some time in their lives. The disease begins with an acute phase lasting typically for six to eight weeks. It continues as a chronic infection, normally without obvious symptoms, that cannot be cured and lasts for life. Now for our region's weather. Hamilton, your Thursday will be very warm, sunny all day with light winds and your expected high is 28 and an overnight, overnight low of 15. Tauranga, your Thursday will be mostly fine with some morning and evening cloud. Your expected high is 25 and an overnight low of 17. Just ahead, an expo on effluent. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. The day has been set for farmers to learn about and discuss the best methods for effluent management and it looks like it will be a must-see for those in the industry. Alan Campbell tells more about the Expo. Well this is the third annual Effluent Expo. Uh, we're running it in uh, partnership with Dairy NZ and uh, it's a chance for dairy farmers uh, from the Waikato region to check out all of the various uh, aspects of effluent management as they consider upgrading their systems. It's currently uh, a lot of dairy farmers are spending quite a lot of money um, upgrading so it's quite important that they can consider the wide range of issues associated with that. So how many exhibitors are already locked in for this event and how many more are you expecting? There's 40 exhibitors and that's all we've got room for. So unfortunately we've had to turn a few away. Um, 
some who weren't quite quick enough off the mark. Um, and, and so there are a few who have missed out. Um, but the 40 exhibitors cover the full range of um, activities that farmers need to take into account. So we've got the breadth. Um, it would have been nicer to have had more depth, admittedly. So what opportunities will be available for those in the farming industry? Well, the, the range of scope that we've got at this expo um, includes everything to do with the design and installation of um, effluent systems that meet the industry standards, the industry code of practice. And once that's done, once a farmer has done that, then they'll have confidence that they can uh, comply with the rules 365 days of the year, as well as get the best value out of the nutrients in their system. So that's quite a key opportunity. And so the matters that are, the, the exhibitors cover um, system design and installation, ponds, pumps, um, liners, construction, earthworks, um, monitoring and, and recording systems so that people know what they've put on and where on their farm. All of that will be um, on the, in the display stands from the exhibitors. And as, in addition to that, we'll be running a series of seminars all day as well. OK, so what will the seminars include? Um, we've got one, one seminar planned on pond design and construction. There's high-risk soils. That's a key factor in, in determining how much land you need and how much storage you need. There's a seminar on the way that we monitor farm compliance, uh, dairy effluent compliance. Mm -hmm. So farmers will get a chance to talk to the staff who actually do that monitoring and find out what makes that work. There's a session on simple designs for relatively small um, dairy herds, uh, just to take the complexity out if the, if the farm is a simple farm, it's a kind of pick up and go. And, um, and we're also hoping to have a couple of farmers who have gone through upgrades uh, talking about their experiences and what's worked and some of the lessons they've learned. And how successful has this expo been in previous years? Well, as I said, this is the third expo. Um, each time we've, we've organised it in conjunction with Dairy NZ. Uh, the past two have had about 500 farmers attend each time. And bearing in mind, there's roughly 4,000, slightly over 4,000 dairy farms in the region. So we've got about a quarter already have attended. So we expect another five to 700 uh, attending this year. When and where will this be held? It's at the Mystery Creek Event Centre on the 26th of March. It starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and runs till 3.30 in the afternoon. Who is this event organised and sponsored by? Well, it's organised by the Waikato Regional Council um, and we initiated this as a result of being aware that farmers were spending so much upgrading. Um, and Dairy NZ came on board and have provided us with sponsorship to uh, keep the thing afloat. Now, I hear there will be accredited designers present on the day. Can you tell me more about this? Yes, the um, accredited effluent system designers uh, is a system that was developed over the last five years or so um, with input from the whole of the dairy and effluent um, industries um, to set up a code of practice and standards so that when a farmer goes to an accredited designer, they know that that person is qualified to do a proper job. There'll be four accredited designers at the expo, and, um, and I am aware that some of our other exhibitors are currently going through the process of getting their accreditation. It's hoped that some of those will have completed that before March, and so these designers will be visible. Uh, they'll be branded at the expo, so farmers will know that when you're talking to those people, they meet the industry standard and therefore they've got the confidence that they're really getting high quality information from those people. And how can viewers find out more information on the Expo? Well, they can contact Waikato Regional Council on our free phone. That's 0800 800 401. For more information, visit www.waikatoregion.gov.nz backslash for farmers. Coming up next, we hear about Marriage Week.
Welcome back. An international marriage week is not so popular here, but James Muir of Tauranga is determined to turn it into a celebrated week here in New Zealand. Hilary caught up with him to find out exactly what Marriage Week is all about. Marriage Week is an initiative out of the churches, basically, working with the community to strengthen marriage in the church and the whole, all of communities. So who is involved with Marriage Week and the Western Bay of Plenty? Well, it's, we're, I'm working, we're working with churches in, in, in uh, Kati Kati, Te Poki, Mount Wanganui, Papamoa and Tauranga. Um, and uh, just last week I emailed all the churches in the Waikato and also um, we, uh, Eastern Bay of Plenty as well. So it's, it's coming out of the church because it's really our calling to take this. But there are community people who ha are concerned as well. They see the brokenness, they see the concern and they want to work with us. So why is it so important for us to have a week that celebrates solely marriage? Why is it important? <laughs> because we don't do much throughout the year. Different large churches hold marriage uh, seminars, the marriage course, other different things, but by and large the church doesn't do much. And we're realizing there's a decline going on. You understand? Decline in marriage, a declining in marriage commitment, and a, and, 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 uh, our children are hurting as a consequence. The families are hurting. So the church needs to make a stand, and the church is making a stand. And so Marriage Week uh, that uh, we're doing in Tauranga is now becoming again a nationwide movement, gradually, slowly, not all of a sudden, but gradually, while other stuff's going on politically, we know that, uh, the church is saying, we're going to make a stand here. We need to speak together on this foundational issue in our nation. So you're finding that more people are choosing not to marry and just live together? They are, and that's, and that's because if they've seen their parents fail, so they'll do a trial for a time, which really understandable but still nonsense. And we, who have the answers for them on how to prepare for married life together, not just for a wedding day, need to be forthright and be out, outspoken and say, hey, we can help you do better for the sake of not just yourselves and your family, but for our whole society. So when and where are some of the events that you're going to be holding? The events, uh, basically, it's, it's kind of a launching. There are events happening in Tauranga. Let me go back a minute. Two years ago, the Mayor of Tauranga and all the councillors hosted myself and a group of pastors to a special luncheon on, on Valentine's Day because we told them, hey, pastors, we've got some bad news. We've got a high divorce rate in Tauranga, the highest per ratio in the country. So the Mayor was keen to hear about this as a Mayor, just to be aware of it. And last year we did a major feature in the local paper and the local MP Simon Bridges gave us support to it as well. So this year we're looking at different churches are hosting the marriage course. Other churches are hosting a, a, an event called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. Very challenging, very bloke focused. Because to be honest, men often don't come to these things willingly. So there are events like these happening in different churches in Tauranga. Also in Kati Kati Tupuki. And then pushing on that in March, the churches of Tepuki, out of concern for what they're seeing with the kiwi fruit disaster right now, the PSA problem, are hosting a special day for couples in the kiwi fruit business. So while Marriage Week 7th to 14th of February is the launch, it's going to carry on beyond that. And beyond that, in March, we have Ian Grant coming to speak in Tauranga to challenge men, dads, about their relationship with their children. So it's kind of a launching time, and there are events then, but it's a launching of other things throughout the year as well. You said that Tauranga has one of the highest divorce rates. Yes. I didn't realise that. Why do you think that is? Well, I said basically, um, uh, we, we've, we've been one of the fastest growing cities in the country. And I was saying, what I realised very quickly is that it's, it's, it's not, people, people who never got married in Tauranga are getting divorced in Tauranga. Couples got moved from, moved from all over the country to Tauranga because it's a great place to live. But a great place to live doesn't guarantee your marriage is going to be secure. And so sadly, many of these couples who don't have any connection with the church are crashing and burning. And so that's why Marriage Week, we want to engage with those couples within the church, outside the church, to help them do better. So is Marriage Week just for the Christian community? Absolutely, it's the whole community. We host communities in hotels, anywhere, any public place um, where church folk, non-church folk can come freely. It, we target anybody, any couple at all that realise they want to do better, they want their relationship strengthened, to benefit them and their children, we want to we want to um, yeah, open it to them. Certainly, yeah. sometimes the church isn't the best place to host those things. And uh, Ian Grant, you said is coming. Who's Ian Grant? Ian Grant uh, was Parenting Inc. 
Uh, you may have heard of him. He's, uh, he's now stepped aside from that, left it to others, and realized that, that he needs to help men to step up. Because, Hillary, to be honest, the challenge we have with Marriage Week, often I get a lot of inquiries to my website, Tauranga Marriage's website. But it's generally a lady who makes the inquiry, but the guy is not so willing. And so Ian wants to fill a large church in Tauranga on the 16th of March and say to men, come on guys, step up. We need to step up as dads, step up as husbands, step up as leaders of a household. And so that's, that's, that's an ongoing event that's taking place out of, out of the whole Marriage Week philosophy, if you like, yeah. Stay tuned as up next we learn about a new initiative to support elderly people. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. A long-term strategy to assess and support the needs of the region's ageing population has begun and I caught up with Mary Ann Gill to find out about the key priorities of this initiative. We have 2,500 people currently on our books who currently either receive residential care or at um, age residential care. It's time for us to actually ascertain whether the sort of uh, work we're doing for them is appropriate for their needs. So there may be some people who think this work will actually uh, see them lose services. That's not what we're aiming to do. What we're aiming to do is have a chat with them, see what sort of services they need, either in their home or in residential care, and target them in that way. And how do you aim to achieve these goals? So we have a, uh, a, an international tool we use called InterEye, and basically we assess their needs, uh, their health needs, and their um, um, community, their social needs. And the tool is, as I say, internationally recognised, a very good tool, been, been well used in this uh, region before. And the people we're bringing in to, to help us with this are from Nurse Maud uh, in Christchurch. And they've worked uh, on the same sort of project down in Christchurch very successfully. So it's a, it's a very, very evidential-based tool. So what benefits could this bring to the elderly? Well, you know, as, as you know, we, are, uh, we, we do have an ageing population. And from the DHB's perspective, you know, we'd rather see people stay either in their homes or in age residential care than be in a hospital. There is nothing more demeaning and upsetting for older people than to be away from their home, from, from their safe environment and from their families in a hospital. So our priority is to keep them out of hospital as much as we can, but still getting appropriate care out in the community. And could other benefits come from this as well? Well, we will see what happens, but I'm sure there will be other benefits. You know, what we do, other DHBs will have a look at as well. You know, across the country we are an ageing population. Uh, you know, um, as I say, falls are, is a big issue for all, for all DHBs, uh, falls in the home, and we want to try and uh, have, prevent those. So this may assist us from an education point of view uh, and, and, you know, have, provide appropriate care for those people and education so that they do not have the falls in their homes, which once they have a fall and end up in hospital, it can be really, really demoralising for them. So how will their needs be assessed? They'll have a health professional who is trained in assessing needs who will either on the phone or one-on-one -on -one like we're doing now have a chat about their needs, you know, what sort of things they'd like in their home. Uh, you know, a lot, of pe a, lot, a lot of older people can't do the sorts of things they used to be able to do. You know, simple things like washing dishes, doing their own laundry, vacuuming the house, you know, those sorts of things. And also putting in place exercises and access to other health professionals that will assist them, either in the home or in their age residential care. Okay, so once assessed, what support will be offered to help uh, retain their independence? Yep, across the board we've got health professionals, all our allied health professionals, so whatever is needed in terms of dietitians, occupational therapists, all that sort of help, whatever is needed, we will be able to um, assess that and provide it. You know, it might be, as I say, some people may not be getting the appropriate care at the moment, and that's really important for us to find out. A lot of people are scared of speaking out, you know, saying, you know, I, I can't cope anymore. This is a way we can say to them, look, we can see you can't cope anymore, we can provide that assistance for you. And how could families be involved? 
Oh, families are critical for this, they really are. They are part of the continuum of care as well. And you know, families are able to uh, keep the spirits of their, of their loved ones um, high as well, those sorts of visits. And you know, families can be involved, actively involved with the health professionals around what is needed for their you know, mother or father or, or, or uh, uncle or aunt, whatever. So yes, families are absolutely important. So how regularly will their cases be assessed? This review is taking place between now and June. So this, this is the, the, the major review. And thereafter, it's, it's an ongoing um, situation where you know, they're assessed as, as people, as they're visited and as they're seen. So you know, um, it, you know, the, the benefit for us is that, that we want to keep them out of hospital. We want to keep them in, in, in their homes with their families, with access to their families or in age residential care. So you know, that's, that's the benefit. And when is this increase likely to begin? Well, we'll do the assessment um, and we're looking at it starting um, uh, uh, from July onwards. So is there a way that families can contact you if they are concerned about their loved ones? Yes, we have a free phone number that we've, uh, we've sent out letters to all of our clients. Um, hopefully they've received those in the last week. There is a free phone number. It's 0800 55 so that's 0800 555 3399. Just give us a ring if you're concerned about your uh, loved one or your family member and uh, we can discuss, uh, discuss it through with, with you, with them. And uh, how will the elderly find out about this initiative? Yes, that's a very good question because they may not actually be contacted by the health professionals until you know, possibly May or June. And so in the interim, what we've done is we've contacted every one of the 2,500 people's general practitioner. So if, the, if you're going to your doctor and the doctor happens to mention it to you, um, the doctor does have more information and, and can give you that uh, readily. If the doctor isn't aware, then please do ring that free phone number, or we do have the information uh, on our website. Plus, when we sent out a letter to our clients, we had all the details about the assessment tool that is used. So, but the most important thing is, don't be fearful of it. It is, it is not a situation where we're hoping to take away services. Far from it, in fact. What we want to do is ensure appropriate services for our older people. They deserve it. They honestly do. That is the news for today. Now we really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have news including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. Hillary will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around the region. I'm Amy Forrest. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.